Okay, so let's jump into this. We're gonna be talking about functional JavaScript and how to build relatively sane applications leveraging that um, construct. So uh, a little bit about me. My name is Dave Bowman. Uh, um, I'm D at D Bowman on Twitter and at GitHub. Uh, D Bowman at Esri.com if you wanna email me about this. Uh, but <clears throat> really this talk is uh, a story about a journey, uh, my journey as a developer. I've been writing software around 21 years. Uh, for 15 years, I was a consultant. And then the last six years, I've been working on the hub team uh, at Esri. And so this has kind of been an interesting journey, right? As a consultant, uh, your, your goal and your motivation really is to you know, build really good software, but your um, creating the software, you're building it, you're making sure it meets all the requirements, you're shipping it to a customer, and then you're moving on to the next um, project that you have. And that's great um, and all that stuff, but it's a little bit different <clears throat> when you're working at a company that's shipping products long-term, right? So Esri, you know, we've got dozens of products, we have all kinds of things on the web, we have software product, uh, desktop software products, server-side pro software products, um, so on our team, it's a little bit different in terms of how we, we optimize stuff, right? We want to optimize for long-term maintenance and flexibility within the system. Uh, so that's a very important thing. On the hub, uh, we also have to accept that complexity is a thing. With hub, the hub as a product, uh, one of the things, the features it brings is it helps orchestrate an awful lot of the rest of the platform. So in addition to the hub being its own software application, we are really interacting with an awful lot of the rest of the platform. And so <clears throat> we really need to kind of accept the complexity is, is gonna be inherent and do whatever we can to make uh, the hub software itself be something that we can understand and we can reason about. And so over my career, you know, this has really led me <clears throat> to embrace and understand functional programming, right? So let's talk about what functional programming is. Uh, at its core, it's a style of programming. And although, you know, it's kind of somewhat new and hip to speak about this in the JavaScript community, functional programming itself is old. <clears throat> it's really old. It really kind of was based back from in the 1930s when Alonzo Church was working on Lambda Calculus and at the same time, Haskell Curry was working on combinatory logic, right? These are two mathematicians, and what they were doing was generating what they called a, a system of computability. <clears throat> and the way they were doing this stuff, they're mathematicians, they're, they're working on paper, or they're working on chalkboards, and, and they're writing out mathematical functions. <clears throat> and this is the, the, the kind of core underlying idea behind a lot of this stuff, right? Mathematical functions they're a little bit different than functions that we have in programming languages. A mathematical function is pretty much always about transforming data or transforming values, right? You have some sort of an equation and you plug values into it and you, you know, do the computation and you get, you get you know, one or more values out the other side. In a programming language, um, since pretty much programming languages were invented, we've all, always had the ability to do some things that you can't, they don't really have an, an allegory or, or an, an analog in um, when we're talking about working on like a chalkboard. And that is the idea about shared state or global variables. Like if you're working at a chalkboard, I don't, what would the you know, shared state or global uh, variables be? Is that like values written on a chalkboard that are on the other side of the room? Um, so I can just you know, grab a value off that chalkboard or push a value to that chalkboard. Like it, it doesn't even really make any sense, right? <clears throat> but when we're talking about um, trying to do kind of a mathematical style of programming and, and using functions that follow the rules of a mathematical style of a function, we need to call it something else, right? Because functions in JavaScript or C Sharp or whatever, um, you can access global state or global variables. Um, so we call these functions that don't work with global variables, we give them a new name, and we call those pure functions. And so this is the, the you know, essential background of functional programming is this concept of like, really we wanna do stuff that's kinda like math, um, works on a lot of mathematical concepts, uh, but 
the, we need a new name once we're talking about it in computer science land, which is to say the idea that uh, the function is pure because it does not you know, reach over to the magic blackboard to grab global state or mutate to global state. The output of <clears throat> following through with these concepts and obviously taking them further than just pure functions, but the net result is that you end up with very robust and much more maintainable software uh, for many reasons, right? The, the robustness comes from the fact that we're going to compose many small functions together. Very small functions are easy to test. You know that they're bomber. And then because they're all, the functions are pure, you can reason about it a little bit better. And we'll talk a little bit more about these concepts as we move ahead. But that's kind of the, the long tail background of this stuff. <clears throat> In terms of languages, right? There's a whole host of different uh, functional programming languages. Some of these you might recognize, Lisp and Haskell and Erlang and Scala. Uh, Elm and OCaml and ML, Clojure is another one. Uh, these are purely functional languages. The only way that you can do things uh, in these languages is in a functional style. Uh, we're going to be talking about JavaScript, right? And that falls into this category of functional programming capable languages, meaning you know it, uh, you can write functional style code in JavaScript. Interestingly, this, these functional uh, style capabilities are also coming to C Sharp and Java. And these are your enterprise system languages, right? Um, if you've ever taken a course in Java or C Sharp, I'm sure you know, your instructor was all about building a class hierarchy about orders or animals or some sort of thing like this. Um, and you're creating I something or other interfaces for all kinds of things. Um, so two languages that are really classically um, very much about building object hierarchies. But they're now implementing these functional capabilities. And so um, it's always interesting to go look at, like, well, why, right? <laughs> After, what, 20 years of Java, they're now saying, you know, instead of classes, all the things, now doing things in a functional style. Well, <clears throat> it's probably not a surprise if you've brought a computer in the last, say, you know, five years, right? If you bought a computer five years ago, you probably got a 3.2 megahertz chip. You bought a computer today, maybe it's 3.4 megahertz. But the difference is probably that you got a lot more cores or that your computer is now um, has a video card in it that's got a ton more cores in it. And realistically, right, <coughs> what we've hit on is we've hidden some maximum kind of density on, on, our, on our circuits, on our uh, CPUs. And so we can't really make them much faster. There's, there's only so many, uh, such a high density of of uh, transistors that we can put in there. There's uh, heat constraints that we're running up against. But instead of uh, making the computer faster, we've made them really wide, right? And so you get lots and lots of CPUs or lots and lots of GPUs. Okay, cool. Um, how does this relate to functional programming? It turns out that pure functions are parallelizable. Um, so that's really, really important uh, if you're gonna make use of all of these cores. So if you had like a list of a million things and you were able to write a pure function and, and map over them, then um, really, you know, depending on the runtime environment, it will be able to run that across all the cores simultaneously. Now the asterisk on here is simply stating that um, JavaScript doesn't do this today, but things like the JVM or the Erlang uh, virtual machine, uh, they can do that and that's really cool. So that's why we're seeing functional uh, capabilities uh, coming across a whole bunch of different languages. And uh, in some cases, and particularly Erlang, it can run not just uh, across you know, all the cores in a CPU, but you can actually run it across an entire cluster of machines, which is super powerful. And if you're interested in a little bit more about that, you should basically um, Google Erlang and WhatsApp, because um, at the time, WhatsApp was sold to Facebook, right? They had an engineering team of 50 people, and they were supporting an application that had 900 million users. So that kind of is a, a quick summary of like, hey, Erlang is pretty rad if you need to do extremely high availability, extremely scaled out stuff. Um, there's a, real, a whole bunch of really interesting articles about that. Um, but again, we're here to talk about JavaScript, so let's move on and uh, talk about that. Let's talk about JavaScript applications. <coughs> Let's talk about, say, this application, right? Pretty generic app. This generic app, you know, we've got these various different references to different parts of our application. We start sending messages around, um, you know, interact at the map. It goes and changes something in the toolbar. Interact with the toolbar. You change the state of the map. Go and add some more visual components, and those things are going to start sending messages around. And 
you know, we're, we're basically touching different parts of our application and okay, so it's great. Our app is working, uh, we finished building it and we put it into production. And then, um, you know, say three, five months later, somebody else needs to go back into this application and, you know, they, they just go into the application and they just change like one small little thing. And this happens, right? I mean, this is kind of a funny gif and things, but it's, it's very common that returning to an application um, that you don't have your head space currently in, it, you can blow things up very easily. And it typically is because what you end up having is, is a whole bunch of shared state and different things are referencing uh, parts of the application in different ways. So what I wanna kind of, the quick takeaway I think from the whole talk here is right, implementing things with a functional style is gonna dramatically help reduce the risks of that sort of a problem down the road. Also, as a side benefit that in general, you can uh, reduce the amount of code that you're writing um, and reuse the various little lower level functions uh, in across other projects or even within your own same project. So when we're, we're dealing with things basically at the function level, which is uh, pretty cool, you end up importing just the functions that you need out of particular libraries, right? And this is great. <clears throat> um, and this is the philosophy that ArcGIS REST.js is fundamentally designed around. And um, we gave another talk that's been recorded uh, about REST.js and we go into the details of how this stuff works. But the benefit of this, again, just even outside of being able to think about your application, uh, but the benefit is that using a build system like Webpack or Rollup, it will be able to tree shake those modules out. So you only get exactly the functions that you really need to execute your code. Um, so that it can really help when you're building applications that need to work well on a mobile device, which is pretty much, if you're building a web application today, you should be uh, orienting it around working well on a mobile device. So <clears throat> perhaps you're still a little bit uh, skeptical this functional programming thing, I don't, I don't really buy it. You know, I don't need to know this. Well, I'd like to also put out there this idea that realistically, um, if you're working on the web today, there's a pretty good chance you're going to be um, utilizing stuff that's based on pro functional paradigms or, um, you know, in order to be very productive with these things, uh, you should understand functional paradigms, right? So React, I mean, it's very core nature of React. Uh, the, the virtual DOM, the idea that the uh, DOM itself is a function of the state of the application. That right there is a functional idea, right? That, you know, like you're taking a state and you're turning it into a DOM. You change the state, uh, you're gonna change the DOM. Redux is the, the idea of uh, working with a set of reducers to create that state, which is then gonna be um, a direct function uh, that creates the DOM. Angular itself has RxJS, which is a functional reactive library. It's baked into it. It is in there. And so just understanding functional concepts uh, as a React developer or Angular developer is going to be useful um, and, and allow you to get a lot more out of those uh, frameworks. Now you might say, hey Dave, we're talking about functions here a whole lot, but we just got fancy ES6 classes. Uh, can we use those? I think we should, that'd be great, right? Um, you can use them. Um, there's definitely some uh, recommendations and guidelines. The first of which is to basically avoid inheritance. <clears throat> the main reason we say that we want to avoid inheritance is that almost always when you build a deep class hierarchy uh, for in the construct of one project, um, either as that project evolves over time or if you want to reuse parts of these things in another application, uh, you almost always get something wrong about that hierarchy. And you end up with situations where you're kind of like, well, I can't actually use that class hierarchy. I'm just going to start copying things and you're going to have new, in new classes which are really similar to old classes, but they have subtle differences in their behavior, so on and so forth. So in general, avoid inheritance because it's very hard to get right, it's extremely easy to get wrong, and really you don't need it. The only time um, you should go with inheritance, and like all rules, you should have exceptions to them, is except when you're using uh, a framework, right? If you're using React or Angular or Ember or Vue or whatever, there are some lower level uh, classes that you should extend, okay? But again, the same thing goes. Um, if you're going to extend from the React uh, component, that's great. Uh, don't build a deep class hierarchy of your own components, right? 
it's just extraordinarily unlikely that you're actually going to be able to reuse that outside of your current project or product. Um, and then even over time, uh, it's a pretty good chance that you got something wrong in your model. Instead of doing that, <coughs> the better um, guidance is to use composition. Now, composition is just a, a fancy math term for doing a mix-in. If you've worked with JavaScript for a while, I'm sure you've you know, come across a mix-in. And it's a very simple way of just taking some existing object, a POJO, if you will, and attaching uh, functions onto it um, so that it can use its own internal state. So you can certainly do that. Uh, the only other thing that goes along with this is that it tends to be beneficial uh, to utilize factory functions, even if you're just still going to use classes. Um, if you use factory functions, it will avoid you having to run all over your application, locate the place where you new stuff up and change it to a factory function if or when you um, end up switching from you know, actual ES6 classes over to something that's more uh, based on a mix-in model. So I definitely would recommend that. If you're going to go down this road, there's a great book called Composing Software by Eric Elliott. I'll talk about this a little bit more at the end. But it's a great book because it talks all about functional programming and then taking those functions and how to use composition to actually create um, something that akin to a class. Uh, so that's really cool. The key ideas that we're going to run through <coughs> in a functional um, construct is this idea of pure functions. I've kind of hit on that. Immutable data, referential transparency, the idea we're going to use a lot of small functions and we're going to compose them using higher order functions. So let's kind of step through those things. A pure function, it depends only, uh, the output depends only on the arguments. We have zero side effects. So in this case, I have this really uh, cheesy little add function here. It takes two numbers, it returns the sum of them. Um, and we call that add with five and three, we get eight. Uh, the Z there, number 10, is, a, is on there to show that we don't, talk to Z, we don't mutate Z, we don't involve Z at all, right? This is a, a pure function, that's all there is to it. Immutable data, um, if you've worked with React, um, I'm sure you've heard the term immutable data. The <clears throat> point of this is that you want to, um, any function should not mutate the data that is handed to it. Uh, that tends to be because when you're working in, a, in an application, particularly like a, a, a web application, you may have multiple components rendered into the DOM, which are actually have references to the same underlying object. Now, if one of those components goes ahead and calls a function and passes that um, data structure into it, if that data structure is mutated, then the other <coughs> component is gonna now have a mutated uh, state in it. And that's probably what you don't want, right? This is the basic definition of how you have that app explode because a change in one place has this unintended side effect of uh, changing it in another. So the way we avoid that stuff is that we return a clone out of all of our functions, right? We never mutate things in our functions, we return a new copy of it. Uh, and that helps your function be pure. Okay, so that's cool. Now, there's important things that you, you wanna talk about here, right? And that is that if you are using really big data structures, you probably want to use something like Immutable JS, which is a library that has really high performance immutable data structures in it. If you're using kind of smaller uh, object graphs, um, you know something like the size of a web map or an item, then you can use a simple deep clone function. Then in, in the repo that we're going to go through here in a little while, we have a five-line um, deep clone function. Super easy. It's what we use all through Hub um, and inside uh, the Hub.js uh, lower level library. If you have a pure, uh, just a, a very flat object graph, you know, it's just a POJO with a bunch of properties on it, none of those, th none of those properties are objects, you can use object assign. Um, you know, immutable JS is the best way to go because you literally cannot mutate the item, uh, or you can't mutate the object. Um, these other options are a little, you know, it, it saves you a dependency and uh, you just have to take on the onus of making sure that you're not mutating stuff yourself. So <clears throat> out of those first two constructs, right, um, we get this benefit called referential transparency. And this is just a way, it, it, it's, it's a side effect of those two things in that you can now reason about your program 
uh, a little bit easier. And it, the, it simply stated, it says your program operates the same way if you replace a function call with the return with its return value. In this case, you know, the program would operate the same way whether you call add with five and three or you just move forward with length set to eight. Um, so it's, it enables you to uh, reason about your, your actual um, software much easier. Uh, you don't have to worry about, I called this function but, and then changed this other thing over there, but what's that thing listening to, so on and so forth. As we see when we go through this, um, <clears throat> the concept of using many, many, many small functions will really come out to bear. We want to make these very small, very generic, extremely highly tested functions, and we want to compose those together into more complex functions. And that brings us to higher order functions, right? And this is where I say the word function even more than I have already. Uh, a higher order function is a function that accepts or returns functions. So I've got two little examples here. This first one is the idea of um, creating a higher order function called add n. And what that returns is a new function that will um, add whatever n value is passed in to whatever, n va whatever value is passed to the new function. So we have um, this deal here where we add five equals add n being passed five. So five is now held in the closure. And then when we call add five and we pass it 10, the result is 15. The five is held in the closure. Um, I also wanted to highlight the idea about using a function like this in a map. Uh, map itself is a higher order function because it takes a function as an argument. And so when we map, uh, one, two, and three using and five, we get an output array of six, seven, and eight because we're simply adding five to those values. Um, <clears throat> we'll be getting more into this as we move forward. This is very simplistic stuff here. Um, when we want to talk about uh, higher order functions, the real power value comes when we're able to use them to compose functions together. So this is a pipe. <clears throat> pipe simply, um, it takes, uh, you know, a set of functions as arguments, as many as you want, and then it's essentially going to uh, return a function that when you call that, the inputs uh, are gonna be sent to the first function, the outputs of that sent to the second, the outputs of that sent to the third, and so forth. It's basically piping data um, through this chain of things. So <laughs> that's kind of functional 101. Let's, uh, let's jump into looking at more code and we can talk about more of this stuff. I wanted to talk about working with an array and doing a very simple operation on it, but doing it in the simplest, most naive way that we could. So I have an array, and what I want to do is get the doubles of all of the numbers that are in this array. Okay, and it's not like I'm not here to talk about computer science. I'm here to talk about, you know, functional programming. Uh, it's not a very useful function, but what do we do here? The most kind of overt way that we can do this <clears throat> is to say, let's create a new output um, array. Now let's use a for loop and we're gonna iterate over things and we're gonna you know, take uh, index into the first array and then double that and multiply it by two and shove that into the new array, so on and so forth. And there's lots of ways that this can go wrong, right? Um, if we initialized i at one, we'd have an off by one error. If uh, we did i greater than, equal to, or less than, equal to, um, we'd have another off by one error, so on and so forth. Um, we still get the right answer, but this is really kind of crufty code. Uh, it turns out arrays know how to iterate themselves, so that's handy, we can use for each. This one here is still, um, you know, it's not bad. We still have this extra deal where we're, we're defining an array and we're manually pushing things in. So hopefully, you know, you've worked enough with JavaScript to realize, hey, there's a map function that on an array that, that can do this stuff. And so this is cool, right? We're able to map and then we just can write a really simple anonymous function in line here. Now, in the functional world, <coughs> we talk about this as being, we want to describe what we want, not how to do it. The first time we, that we did this with the for loop, we're really instructing the computer how to iterate over the array and get the value and then double it and so on and so forth. In uh, this case, we're using map, we're really just describing what we want, right? Well, we want the values in this array, but multiplied by two. So let's uh, keep going with this stuff. Now, if we deal with sparse arrays, this can happen sometimes, right? We now have a null in an array. <clears throat> now, if we just use uh, that sparse thing and we called map on it and we squared it, um, 
If you're a JavaScript developer, this would totally make sense that we got a zero in here because, it, of course, it, it is coherent to say that null times null is zero. Um, but realistically, right, um, notwithstanding that weird feature of JavaScript, we really want to just skip that null. Um, so instead of doing a map, what we want to do is use reduce. So array.reduce applies a function to each element and it may accumulate the output value. So the reduce function itself, uh, reduce takes two um, inputs, uh, the reducer function and an initial value. In this case, our initial value uh, is going to be an array because we want to accumulate things into an array. And uh, our reducer function itself, so that's a function, it takes uh, two parameters. Uh, the first is the accumulator, the second is the entry. There's a few more if you do want to get access to the original array or the current index. Uh, those also get passed in. But what we're really focusing on here is just the two things that you need pretty much all the time is the accumulator and the entry. The most common mistake you're going to make when you start writing reduce is that you're going to forget to return the accumulator. So when I write a reduce, I always just stub it out exactly like this. I always call it ACC and entry and I always return the ACC at the beginning and then I start writing code inside of it. Now, in terms of how do we actually make sure we're not returning the square of null, well, we can just put a very simple guard clause in here. And this is a pathetically simple guard clause, right? It's just checking to see if n is falsy. Um, so we probably want to put something a little bit smarter in here, like if, is it, if it's not a number, so on and so forth, um, that sort of thing. But if n is not falsy, then go ahead and push the square in. And what we get out of this is 1, 4, and 16 instead of 1, 4, and 0. So <coughs> building on top of reduce, you can build all kinds of super powerful things using reduce. You can build map, you can build filter, you can do all kinds of neat stuff. In this example here, what we're going to do is um, use reduce to go find, to go and filter out all of the entries into our data array where color is red. Now these are very simple object graphs, right? They just only have one, one property in them. Um, they, they don't need to be like that, right? These can be deep object graphs and what we're looking for could be as deep down that thing as we want. They could be complete web maps, whatever you want. Uh, it just, just fits on a slide. So in this case, if you know, we have a reduce, we look at each entry, we say, hey, if the color is red, that's the thing I want, then I'm gonna return it. And then I get the reds and you know, when you log that out, it's an array and it has the one entry in it. Okay, cool. But we could take this and we can generalize it. <clears throat> we could build a filter by function. And our filter by function takes a property, color, a value, in this case, you know, red, or the, um, the example below here is blue, and then an array. And what is it gonna do? It's gonna do exactly the same thing that we just did in the other one, but we've made it more generic, which is really handy. And then this is saying, hey, blues, you filter by color blue and pass it an array. So that's um, you know kind of some introductory low-level things. Now I wanted to move on to talking about an actual example application so that there's a whole bunch of code that you can kind of work with and play with. So <laughs> the example app, I'm a, I'm a big mountain biker and in Northern Colorado we have a lot of trails and I, um, particularly in the springtime around now, you know, varying trail conditions, these trails get open and closed and they open and close on kind of almost an hourly basis at some points in the year. So I wanted to build a very mobile friendly application uh, to let me see this on my phone. There is a map based application, um, great stuff. You know, it's really cool. It's got a map that's rad. Uh, it takes like 40 seconds to 60 seconds to load on a mobile device. And I, you know, I'm just not really very patient like that. So I went and just said, okay, I'm gonna go get the same data they use. I'm gonna talk to the same feature services, but I'm gonna render it just in a table. Um, and it renders a lot faster. So the app lives at nocotrails.surge.sh and the code is on my GitHub um, at trail status react. So let's take a quick look at uh, this UI, <coughs> just so we're on the same page as we move through this. We're talking about the same stuff. Uh, interestingly, it takes about 500 milliseconds for the first paint, so the app loads wicked fast on a mobile phone. And then after doing the queries, um, which takes like 7.8 seconds, and it takes another you know, 200 milliseconds to actually do the render. So very quick stuff. UI wise, very little interaction here. We just have these three buttons at the top, open, closed, or um, all is the status, so you can filter it. 
Um, <clears throat> then the UI is composed of these little blocks. We have what we call the area, and then we have the trails and the status. Um, and, and that's really it. It's just like that sort of stuff repeated down the page. Component-wise, I'm not really going to talk about the React side of this thing, but if you're uh, you know, looking at the source code, Navbar JSX just has this uh, components at the top for setting those things. We have an area um, component, and then we have an individual trail that's composed into that thing. And then, of course, everything is wrapped inside the app itself, which kicks everything off um, and is really kind of the container for everything. The stuff we're gonna be looking at here from the functional perspective is this idea about getting the data and preparing it for the render. Um, and so what do we have to do? Well, there's a series of events here where we've got to query some feature services. We wanna, there's two of them. We wanna combine the results. We wanna then just kinda of massage the data so it's in a nice format um, to go and put on the screen. So that's all these other functions. Let's take a quick look at what this data looks like. <coughs> So if you've been working with Esri feature services for any amount of time, you'll kind of notice uh, this structure. It's not very much of a surprise. Um, the data that you get back when you query a feature service is interesting. It's got you know a set of field aliases, a default display name, and then it has a features array in it. Uh, so interesting things here. We have to edit. We have to hit these two feature services. Um, they have different field names that contain kind of like the natural area or the, the park or whatever the case may be. So we're going to normalize that stuff out. Uh, we have <clears throat> the nesting. So in a feature service, right, each feature uh, is returned as an object that has two top level properties. One is attributes and the other one's geometry. When we issue these queries to the feature service, we tell it we don't want the geometry. Like we don't need that. Let's not send that over the wire. So the geometry node's already missing, but now we have this extra level of nesting. And I don't really like that, right? I want um, the UI to be fairly ignorant of where the data is coming from, so I want to normalize that out. And then the other thing that's interesting here is um, on one of these feature services, the status field, uh, null means closed. So I guess they must have some JavaScript developers in their GIS department as well. So we need to go and convert that into a string so that our user interface just has to render a string. So when we think about how can we actually implement um, this set of operations that we want, the, the simplest way we can do this, um, and all of this code is actually in the repo, and, it, and it's, it's not just like in there, it's, it's in the master branch. And I just have a whole bunch of different versions of these functions, you know? So there's this get data naive, and this is an example about how you could do that. You do promise all, you've got two little functions that know how to execute the XHRs, the filters.status is just, you know, all um, open and closed. Um, but we would call that, and then we would just go and put all of our work and logic inside this then block, right? Uh, we can do that um, many times when you're just prototyping stuff and you're hacking things together. It's a very efficient way to do it. Your downside is, it's extremely difficult to test, right? Um, to write a test for this because you know now you got to get into fetch mock uh, to mock the actual XHRs coming out of these other functions, so on and so forth. And you can't reuse any of it because it's all inside of then block. So that's not very good. So a less naive approach to this is to say, okay, well, why don't I go and take the data fetching uh, out, put that into its own little function that still is just going to delegate off to these other two, promise all, do its thing, and then. Uh, instead of just having all of the work done in line in that then block, you just call out to another function, process data. So that's beneficial because now at least um, you can call process data independently. Um, so that, that's really good and you can just you know, set up your, your uh, you know, input data and verify that you're getting the right output data out. Yeah, I would still kind of hesitate, right? We don't want to write big, giant, you know, six screens of, of uh, logic at all once, right? We want to do things functionally. We want to compose a set of small functions. So this would be a, kind of a more elegant way to do it and get data with a chain, this, this function here, where we say, okay, let's fetch the data using the filters and then um, call the merge features function, then call extract attributes, then remap the fields. So this is really nice. It reads well. Um, and the promise chain makes it obvious, but promises 
Really, we should be using promises in JavaScript for asynchronous operations, not for things that actually can be synchronous. It's just a whole bunch of extra overload, right? Each uh, function is going to actually you know, make sure that it, it calls the then block on the next tick of the event loop, so on and so forth. So performance-wise, this is uh, not egregious by any means, but it's certainly not as good as it could be. Um, and uh, although it is very nice to read this. What we could do instead of that is something like this, where we um, you know, use pipe to create a new process data function, and that process data function is simply going to pass the data into merge features, and then the output goes into extract, and that goes into remap, and then it goes into dedupe, so on and so forth. So this is your generic composition. <clears throat> so let's look at what that pipe function looks like. This is, um, Earlier I showed that extremely terse ES6 version of it. Um, this is the slightly more verbose, uh, but exactly functionally the same version of it. So um, pipe is a function that takes a, uh, uses the gather syntax to say, take all of the things that were passed to me, all of my arguments, and, and coalesce them into an array, then return a new function that's gonna take the data we're gonna operate on. Um, and inside of that function is a closure over this array that was uh, over the array of functions. And then we call reduce on that. And we basically execute everything in order. Um, so that's really you know, pretty straightforward stuff right there. Um, so that's cool. Let's, let's look at uh, the individual steps here. Let's talk about merging the responses. <clears throat> so merge responses, merge features is pretty straightforward. We take, uh, you know, this is coming out of a promise all. The promise all is gonna return an array uh, of the uh, promises that um, were executed. And so we know query responses is going to be an array. And so what we do there is we just reduce over that and we return um, the accumulator and we just concat in the query response.features. Now you could do this using spread syntax, which is kind of cool. The nice thing about doing it with reduce though is that if I added, instead of just having two, um, two uh, uh, services that I need to call, maybe I need to call the state park trail service, right? And so I would add a third one in. Uh, using reduce means it doesn't care how many things are in there. If I was doing spread syntax, I would actually have to go edit it to make sure that I took the third one and, and accumulated it in here. So that's kind of nice. Um, so the, the actual function itself is super lean and, and easy to follow. Then I have the unit tests down here below, which are super easy to set up. I create two responses, which are feature objects that have uh, features arrays inside of them. I call merge features with the two, and then I have four little expectations. And so this completely covers all the cases that we have right here um, on our function. So very straightforward. <coughs> Let's talk about how we get rid of that attribute nesting. So this is uh, what we have right now, right? Is the attributes uh, and the array is kind of nested one level deep. All we want to really do is just take that, um, that set of properties and move it up one level, get rid of the extra, extra level in it. So the simplest way we can do this, again, is just to use a map, um, but we have to do these checks. We have to make sure that the entry is not null, and then we want to say, hey, entry, do you have an attributes object? Okay, cool, you do, then just return that object. That's very straightforward. Um, but when I'm writing this sort of code, and this works perfectly, right? But when I'm writing this sort of code and I see if statements in it, that always gives me the eebie because, you know, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could write a function um, to make sure that we don't we don't have to write this kind of more verbose stuff right here. So what I did was I created a function called get prop. Um, and so it's gonna get the property attributes off of the object called entry. Uh, and it will return, um, you know, either undefined, it won't blow up is the most important thing. And then we have a default value. So get prop takes a path, it can be a deeply dotted path or just the single, you know, single string. Uh, the object you're looking for, and then a default value. <coughs> so if you've ever written code that looks like this, where you have to do something like, hey, okay, I want the default value to be red, but then I want to deeply dot into something to go get a possible value and get that out of there, um, using something like get prop just collapses this down into a single line. This is stuff that we use all over um, the Hub.js library, which is kind of the bottom, you know, the bottom tier of the Hub um, architecture itself. Um, we use it all through our, our Ember source code as well in all our utility functions. So super powerful thing. Uh, what does that look like? It's, again, not a very complicated function. It takes a path, an object, and gives you default. 
It takes the path, it splits it on dot, and then reduces over that and simply checks to say, hey, does this thing have a value at this point? If not, then um, return the default. So that's really, really handy stuff. Let's look at the next step here and get back to the removing of our nested attributes. So <clears throat> again, our, um, you know, what we wanna do is uh, create a function that we can pass into map. Um, map, remember, uh, it's just gonna hand in the entry. So we need to predefine uh, the, um, the first value that's gonna go into our get properties function. This is called um, partial application. So this get adders function that we create here is a specialization of the get properties function where we've already pre-applied this string attributes. And then we can use it in a map to say, you know, features.map get attributes. Uh, so Again, this is called partial application. <clears throat> and so like so many things, we can extract that into utility uh, that we're gonna call partial. And so it does exactly that same thing that we just did before, but we can um, do it as a, a function. Partial takes a function, and in this case, this is a very simplistic uh, implementation. It takes you know just the first argument, and it's gonna return a new function that um, will allow you to apply the second argument and then execute this function. So this is what it looks like. Uh, it returns a new function that takes the second argument and then the first arguments in the closure. And uh, when you execute the return function, it executes the original function with both arguments applied to it. A more generic version, um, <clears throat> it looks like this, uh, so that you can pass in multiple arguments. Um, initially and partially apply any of them and then apply more arguments uh, at a later time. So this is kind of a more, even more generic version of it. Let's talk about the schema normalization step. Um, for the most part, what we're doing here is um, we again have the data on the left. To start with, we have all these property names that are all uppercase and they're not consistent. And what I want is them to be pretty and consistent. So we're gonna get the, the output on the right hand side here. To do this, <clears throat> I basically built a function called remap fields and it's gonna take the array of features in. This extract map is simply a crosswalk between the uppercase um, property names that we have today and the lowercase property names that we wanna have uh, coming out of this. Then <clears throat> I created a, oh, created a, a new uh, function called extract props. I want to partially apply that um, with the extract map and create this new one, the swap properties function, which I can then use in a map. So we're gonna kind of dig down this thing now. <clears throat> what does the extract props look like? Well, okay, it takes that field map and then it takes the actual object that we're working with. And so it's gonna go and uh, reduce over the keys in the field map. This is all those uppercase property names. Then it's going to maybe add, and so this is a function we'll talk about in a second. It's gonna maybe add a property name um, onto a, the existing property, which is our accumulator. So at the end here, you see instead of passing an array in, we're passing in an empty object, which is our accumulator. So we maybe add a property um, with the new name, which is field map old property name, uh, getting the property off of the object itself and attaching it onto the accumulator. Kind of complicated right here, but realistically, um, it's super terse and it works exactly the way we want. The point I wanted to bring up here though, is to have a function called maybe add. And this takes a key and a value and a target. If the value is not null, it's going to attach the value onto the target object using the passed in key. This is what it looks like. Um, it's not overly complicated, right? The, most of these little functions that at the bottom of the tree are, are not very complicated. So if the value is not null and not undefined, go ahead, um, you know, redefine target as being a cloned version of the thing that was passed in, then attach target.key um, as the clone of the value. And so this is nice because it actually is gonna allow you to um, attach in deep object graphs. Um, and again, using clone object, will make sure that you're getting a new copy of that and you're not mutating anything uh, or reconnecting stuff in ways you don't expect. So how do we dedupe records? That's the next thing. So this is really a function of the fact that we're calling a feature service. And um, if you're familiar with that, um, it, any individual feature like a trail, 
uh, or a trail in the real world is probably represented by multiple individual features, little line segments, right? Um, so what we want to do is dedupe those things. We only want one, um, you know, West Spring Creek Trail in the Ross Natural Area, uh, as opposed to having seven or ten or fifty records for it, just because there's that many um, actual line segments. Dedupe segments, uh, that function itself is relatively straightforward. We just um, call unique by and we pass it the value that we want to do the uniquing by and pass it the array. <clears throat> the unique by function, again, we're going to lean on reduce and then we're going to create uh, this name matches function, which is uh, a predicate. It's just something that returns a true or false. And we can utilize that inside of find. Now I've, I've highlighted again, you know, we have an if statement here and if statements again, give us the EVGBs in uh, our low level functions. And typically we want to try and take those out, convert them into functions, which is what I did and said, okay, hey, let's make something similar to that maybe add, uh, we'll call it maybe push. And it has the same general idea that maybe push, uh, if the value is not null, then push it into our array. So you guys can look up the source code for how that works, but it, it's the same basic idea. Now let's talk about how we scrub the rows. Uh, this is the very simple part um, where the row dot status, if it's null, we want it to be the string closed. I'm not gonna try and extract this out because realistically, this is extremely unique to this data. If row dot status is not defined, then let's just set it to be closed. Sometimes this is completely reasonable. Um, so we just go ahead and do that. And that's what that function is. Grouping things into areas. Um, so this gets a little bit complicated um, in terms of we're gonna do a whole bunch of juggling of data structures here. So what we start off with is this um, code on the left or the JavaScript on, JSON on the right, left, sorry. So we have an area and what we wanna do is say, okay, for every entry in here that has, shares this area name of Ross natural area, we wanna collect those things together put them into an object that has the name Ross Natural Area, and then every one of those entries, I wanna put them into an array called entries. I use these very generic terms over here on the right-hand side, areas, group, and entries. And I do that for a reason, because what I wanna do is write a very generic function to do this. So I can take you know, any kind of a, an array of things and run this group by function on it. And so <clears throat> this gets, you know, not surprisingly, it's not super trivial here, but we're gonna reduce over the rows. We're gonna use that predicate name matches. We're gonna see if we can find that group inside of our accumulator already. If we can find it, we're just gonna take our current row and attach it into the entries array, push it in there. Otherwise, we're gonna create a new um, object to go push into the top level of it, which is the group, and it's gonna have um, the, row, the, uh, the row property, which is name in this case, there, and then the entries array. Um, so when we work this thing, and there's unit tests in the code, so you can actually see how this works, uh, but that's gonna do all the work for us. So sorting McSort face, we've reached the point in the uh, very tech heavy part of this talk where you gotta make some sort of a silly joke, so let's talk about sorting. This gets interesting. Um, essentially, this is now the structure that we've got at this point. <clears throat> what we wanna do is sort all of the areas in the, the areas array by the group name. And then we want to sort the entries for each of those areas by name inside of itself. And so this, um, is actually not nearly as complicated as you would think it is. We wanna take data.areas, we want to sort that by the group, and so we just call a sort by function on that. And again, we're, we're resetting the value here, bing. Um, <clears throat> we're reordering things, and there's definitely certain philosophies about whether this is mutating things in a bad way or in a good way. But uh, the way I opted it, it was to not do any cloning here. You certainly could. Um, so that handles getting the areas in the right order. And then we go and map over those areas. And for each one of the areas, we then call exactly the same thing, uh, but we're working on the entries. And again, we're using the sort by function, which is cool, right? We wrote run function, we're able to call it twice. And again, it's really not very complicated because all we're doing here is a string alphabetical sort uh, 
Um, the only difference from between this and the kind of canonical, how do you write a sort by uh, <clears throat> um, example that's uh, on the Mozilla Developer Network is just this business where we're, we're looking at a particular property name as opposed to you know, the more generic example is just assumes things are strings. Uh, so this is you know, very straightforward. And the net result is, right, we get this user interface. And so you know, I invite you to kind of look at the source code, play with it, run it, uh, poke around at it. Uh, what's really cool is A, it's very, very robust code. Uh, B, it's very fast. Um, and there's really not that much code to it. And the test coverage, like there's not that many tests. So I was able to build, you know, granted it's not the most complicated application by a, a long stretch, right? But I was able to build a very robust application um, uh, very quickly and, and using these uh, concepts. So if you're paying, paying attention through this, there's some trade-offs that we've made um, how we're doing this today. Now, what we've done here is we've really leaned on piping. Now, the, the downside of piping, right, is uh, we're creating a whole bunch of intermediate arrays. Now, if we're doing something like, you know, the Northern Colorado um, trails, what do we have, like a couple hundred independent features? Not a big deal. You can probably do this up to like, you know, maybe 10 or 15,000 things you can run through this, and it's probably not too bad. Uh, if you had 100 steps, that would probably be more of a problem. If you were dealing with a million items, that would be a much bigger problem. Uh, and then it becomes a real problem if you're dealing with a stream, right? And a stream that doesn't actually have an end. So because it doesn't have an end, then you can't actually, um, you know, create intermediate arrays because you never had the whole array to start with. So you have to have a different approach. And this is really this idea where your items are processed once and they're dumped into a final array or just they're just sent further on. Um, and a way to tackle this uh, that I didn't feel was really a thing to get involved with here at this point is transducers. Uh, this is a conceptual framework for doing this. And basically, it's a, a functional uh, concept that allows you to write composable reducers is essentially what's going on. So um, if you're interested in this, it's familiar with uh, Clojure. Uh, that's a language I think where maybe this came from. Um, it's also Lisp. A very common idea to do this sort of stuff with Lisp, uh, but there are ways to do it in JavaScript as well. So let's suppose that you just suffered your way through 50 minutes of this talk and you think this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. How do you start you doing any of this stuff today? Um, you know, not everybody gets to file new project uh, on a weekly basis. So how do you start folding this into the code you're working with today? The first thing I'd suggest is to start uh, leaning heavily onto array functions, right? Your map, reduce, filter, sort, those sorts of things. I mean, that's great. A, um, you know, it's already there. Uh, B, it's really nice that you can, you know, leverage pure functions with that stuff. Um, once you start doing that, uh, you'll start to think a little bit more along these lines. Then I'd uh, recommend bringing in more helpers or writing your own, uh, really. You know, get prop, set prop, and clone object. These are um, relatively straightforward functions to write. Um, there are implementations of this in the source code. You know, you can, you can grab those, it's totally fine. Uh, clone object, we use this all over the place in the hub, um, in hub.js, and I'm probably gonna end up putting that into rest.js because it's super powerful um, as you start to actually manipulate things. Uh, get and set are really awesome. They allow you to, you know, as, we, as we've seen, not have to do a whole bunch of checking to go deep in an object tree uh, on both sides, setting and getting. Then you can consider bringing in more libraries. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different libraries out there. They have pros and cons. Uh, Ramda is super cool, or Ramda, or I'm not even really sure. But uh, it's a huge library. It's got a bajillion functions in it. Uh, the hardest thing I think about Ramda is figuring out what function you need. This is really rad if you're coming from Haskell or a purely functional environment and you want to find a particular function. Um, that's fantastic, super awesome, because this is going to cover absolutely everything. Uh, it can be a little bit uh, big to chew off and to actually know what you want to use, but it's certainly full featured. Another thing that you may be more familiar with if you've used Lodash in the past, there's Lodash slash FP, which is a functional programming style um, version of the library. Um, the only downside I think about Lodash FP is to a very large extent, kind of like Lodash itself, 
uh, you only want a few things out of Lodash, but you end up getting like 75% of Lodash. So it's kind of hard to get a really small build out of it. Upside is you get a lot of po uh, power and functionality. Here's another really cool thing, the awesome FP repo on GitHub. So the awesome repos are just, you know, these big curated lists of various different things. So there's a list of libraries. Um, there's also, on this page, there's um, a section of just, you know, pure ES6 uh, implementations of very, very common functions. So if you wanted to find a curry function uh, that you can just, you know, it's MIT licensed, you just hoist it out and drop it into your code, that's fantastic. So it's a nice way to keep your code really light, just pull in exactly the functions that you need. You didn't pull in half of Lodash that you weren't anticipating. Reading wise, um, <clears throat> good uh, series of medium posts here. Uh, so you want to be a functional programmer is really cool. Uh, functional light JavaScript. It's a book by Kyle Simpson. It's also on GitHub. This is really good, right? This is coming at it from exactly this perspective of you're currently writing JavaScript. You have existing applications. How can you start folding in functional concepts and seeing benefits? When you get a little bit more into uh, functional um, programming, Professor Frisbee's Mostly Adequate Guide to Functional Programming is good. Um, it certainly, you know, kind of grades into it. It gets a lot of very useful stuff out of the way at the beginning, and then it will start getting into a whole lot more combinatory logic type things uh, as you get a little deeper in. So very cool. Uh, the water can get deep in that one. I don't know that I've you know, finished reading it, but I don't think I followed the last third of it by any means. And then Composing Software, I mentioned this before by Eric Elliott. It's also a series of um, medium posts. Very good stuff. Eric Elliott's a great author, um, super entertaining to read uh, his stuff. So to wrap this up, right, we had our key ideas. Uh, the idea that you want to have pure functions. They don't mutate state outside of themselves. Um, uh, we have immutable data, so we're not um, changing things out from underneath other parts of our application. <clears throat> the upside of both of those things is that our app now gains referential transparency in that we can look at uh, a part of our application and we know, hey, there's a function call here, but I'm not mutating anything else and they don't have any other weird side effects. <clears throat> we compose our application out of a whole slew of very small functions. We try and avoid if statements where we can and kind of wrap that stuff up into other functions. And then we compose things using higher order functions. And so that's, uh, that's it for this talk. Uh, again, I'm dbowman at esri.com if you have questions about this. Uh, the other thing you can do is go over to this repo down here, dbowman trail status react. Uh, you can put issues in there, um, ask some questions like that. So that's it. Thank you.